thanks for attending today. We're going to be looking at how you can work smarter in Archicad with Cadimage tools. Some of you may already be aware of Cadimage as a company. I'm going to explain a little bit about Cadimage UK and the presence in the UK, how that's involved with the main Cadimage company and a few other bits and pieces. My name is Ken Good. If you have any questions, as I say, stick them into the Q&A panel and I'll look at that either as we're going through or come back to individually later. Okay, so let's get started. There's not too much PowerPoint. We're going to do a little bit of PowerPoint into Archicad to show you the Cadimage tools and then just round off, we'll talk about a promotion that's available for webinar attendees. So let's just get started. So the first thing I suppose is just to explain a little bit about Cadimage Group. As a group, the aim of the company primarily is to develop, distribute, support, service, software uh, in the building industry for AEC companies. So that's the, the kind of background. The company's 23 years old. There's been significant growth over the past few years, both in the actual customer base, the number of users, but also through the acquisition of other companies. So you'll see here the, you know, the structure. There is Cadimage. This is where the main development force takes place. There's Cadimage UK, which we're going to talk about in a second. Probably more importantly to mention is Graphsoft New Zealand because Cadimage actually uh, are the, the reseller and distributor for Archicad in the New Zealand market and they've been in that game since 1991. But probably the important fact to point out there is in New Zealand there's actually a, an Archicad to Revit ratio of two Archicads for every Revit license. So they're obviously a very strong dominant force in New Zealand market. More recently, there's been the acquisition of these other companies, uh, CAD Consult, PLM. Um, this was to extend business into a slightly different marketplace into engineering software solutions. Uh, and then more recently, again, just earlier this year, there was the acquisition of Endurosim, which expands the reach in the Southern Hemisphere into the, the Australian marketplace as well. But uh, obviously, we're going to talk about Academies UK uh, in just a second. So that just sets a little bit of the kind of background. In terms of the company, I've already mentioned the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, head office is based in Auckland. There's also Christchurch office. Uh, more recently, the, the Sydney office. And then I'm going to come on and talk about the Bristol office uh, in a little while. In terms of the company, everybody in the company is actually available on the website. You can go take a look at our lovely photographs. Uh, I like to think the closer you are to the bottom of the list, the more important you happen to be. There's a company of, of 26 people behind Cadimage and each one of us have got particular skills in particular areas, whether it's sales, support, um, marketing. I'm trying to think what my skill is, but uh, it's got to be in there somewhere. But basically each one of us, we have a, a specific kind of role. But on top of that, in terms of keeping on top of what the software is and everything else, there tends to be a rotation through the company. So each person is involved with the development of the software, the beta testing, whatever it happens to be, just to keep in touch with what's actually going on with it. Just a little bit about myself, as me. I started with Cadimage earlier on this year. Uh, I actually started off helping out with the beta testing for preparation for the launch of version 17, um, and then that developed and here I am today. Again, I'll talk about that in a second. But uh, my background is I've got a degree in computer engineering, which got me into AutoCAD, the dark side in the, the good old days. Uh, from that, led on to Archicad, and sort of 17 years later, here I am. A couple of years ago, I had a book published called Discover Smart BIM. It's a, a sort of reference guide for getting me started with Archicad and up to speed and, and running with it. And um, I worked out just earlier this year that I've got something like 15,000 hours training experience. Uh, it's not all Archicad, but the vast, vast majority is Archicad. And as I've said to many people on many occasions, Archicad's not a career choice, it's a lifestyle. There's so just a little bit about Academy's tools, basically where they came from and why they're there. Uh, initially, there was a, a need for a particular tools. It was customer feedback. Again, this is New Zealand-based, but uh, the company wanted to help the customers by developing solutions for particular tasks. These were sort of things that were just not possible to do in standard Archicad. So the early tools were things like Door and Window Builder, Cabinet Builder, and they were specifically for, as the name suggests, specific tasks. So doors, windows, cabinets, stairs was another one. This was to give local uh, content to actually differentiate Archicad from the other solutions that were available at the time in New Zealand. Following a, an event that Campbell presented at uh, the Los Angeles Summer School in 2004, the feedback was so positive that it was decided to actually launch the products internationally and now the sales to over 80 countries across the planet. 
Uh, today, the range is 17 or so products. We're going to have a look at them in a little minute or two, but it's continually changing and evolving. So just a little bit of Academies UK. This was set up primarily to establish a base in the UK to serve the UK customers. The company was formed tail end of last year, basically through the acquisition of Encina. Some of you may already know Encina and some of the products like Objective, FrameWrite, GBXML. Basically, Encina became part of the Academies group, which increases the development capabilities of, of Academies as a whole. It also increases the product range because the, the former Encina tools are now being re-released as the Academies tools rebranded and brought up to date with the sort of latest interface specifications, etc., to match the whole range. In terms of local support, as I said earlier, I started initially providing beta testing for version 17, but following the release of that, I was asked to, to stay on and look at addressing localised support and providing a presence in the UK from that sort of purpose. So just in terms of the tools, this is a list of the, the current tool set. Uh, floor framing you'll see at the bottom left there is coming soon. It's just in the, the final phase of, of testing ready for release. Uh, there'll be more news on that through newsletters and things shortly. As you can see, it's a fairly big range and there'll be a test at the end to see how much you memorise. But Looking at it like that, it's just a range of products and names. If I actually classify them into the different category types, what this does is allow us to sort of pick out and highlight the different elements for particular tasks. So there's design-based tools such as cabinets, coverings, the documentation, electrical detail elements, structural, there's things like objective, floor framing, wall frames, and then there's a the specialities as well. So I'm going to come on and look at them. I'm going to look at the top five tools in just a second. Uh, one second, literally. So the top five is actually six. Based on the, the most up-to-date figures, the number five bestseller is actually tied between objective and electrical. Obviously, they do two completely different things, but I'll give you a quick taste of what those are. Academy Stairs is number four. Then we'll be Keynotes, Coverings, and the top seller is Doors and Windows. So I'm going to take a look at all of these but it'll be a very brief look because we've got limited time and a, a lot of stuff to go through. I could talk for days, so it'll be a brief look at each one of these tools. If you want to go and take a little bit more of a look, uh, you can take a look at the Academies website, academies.com. This is not just the tools. There's a whole load of stuff on here in terms of Archicad from tips, tricks, an extensive knowledge base. There's a tip of the day as well as some free objects that are available and templates and work environments for Archicad. So it's a complete resource for all Archicad related uh, components. So what I'm going to do is switch out to Archicad and take a run through the top five tools that are available. So let's get started and have a look at the tools in Archicad. This is Archicad 17 I'm looking at. It's a standard installation on Windows 8.1 funnily enough and I have the, the Academy's tools installed. So it does a couple of things. First off, it adds Academy's menu, and you can see I've got all the tools installed, so there's a lot of different options in here. Objective sits just outside there on its own because it's got a number of sub-menus it will use, so we'll come back to that as well. The other thing that happens when you install the Academy's tools is the toolbox itself is slightly modified. So there's things here like the slab tool, and then we have the slab edge tool. So that is a specific Academy's product. There's then the standard stair tool for Archicad, and then poly stair, which is Academy stairs. In addition to that, stairs have a railing component, which is also here. And you'll see there's a few other bits. There's cabinets, there's electrical. Um, down here, there's detail elements, a few other bits and pieces. Some of the tools are menu-driven or command-driven, so they don't actually have separate buttons on the toolbox. Things like doors and windows, those are just objects that sit inside the standard door and window tool. So they all behave in slightly different ways depending on the functions. But if we take a look at this building, fantastic building. It's got some hideous features, but it's there to primarily show off the functions that I'm going to talk about and look at today. So what I'll do is I'll just begin by going into doors and windows. First thing I was going to look at was doors and windows because obviously they're a kind of major part of any particular building. So here we have some windows and basically they just behave like regular windows and doors. So if I just grab this particular component, you'll see it selects in the same way I've actually gone in to edit it, but you'll see it selects 
visually looks the same as standard. There's some extra components here because we can visually do things like put on a little bit of a Scottish jam detail, we could um, return skins for cavity closures and all sorts of bits and pieces that way. But uh, if we take a look, let's have a look at a window that's already been done. I'm keeping an eye here, there's a couple of seconds delay between what I've actually clicked and what you guys actually see, so I'll try and keep an eye on that to make sure I'm not too far ahead of where you guys are. So, um, First thing I'm going to do is just take a look at a fairly standard uh, window that's been put together with uh, the Academy's window tool, just to differentiate this from the standard window that's in ARCHICAD. So there I have selected a window, and all I'm going to do is go into the settings. So the settings, what you'll see different here is this window is completely on its own, and the entire range uh, of infinite possibilities that are available with Academy's window tool is available through just the one physical object. So it sits in its own little library, uh, out with the standard ARCHICAD library, and this does all the bits and pieces that we need. I suppose the first thing is, you know, this part of the dialog is familiar to everybody, this hasn't changed any because this is standard ARCHICAD. What we're looking at is this Academy's window panel, and it's obviously a separate one for doors as well. It's in here that we can configure the window to do what we want it to do, so maybe if I just show one of the most sort of significant differences between standard ARCHICAD and Academy's windows, is if I take a look at this window, you'll see this three blue panel selected and there's one white panel. I can actually click within this dialog to select those components. So rather than using a pull down dialog to say I want to work on this panel, I just physically click on the panel and it selects. So maybe what I'll do actually is take the three that are selected and say give me a copy of them. And when I do that, what it does is just physically duplicate what's there, but you'll see the sizes, the parameters that give it its position, its length, its width, its height, its depth, its physical position in the wall, all of that remains completely unchanged. So I'm able to modify quite quickly without having to, to worry about has the size changed, has the position changed, there's none of that actually going on here. What I could do then is maybe move that across, make sure to select the right one actually, and we'll maybe make this a, whoops, a three, so we'll match the previous one I had and we'll maybe change this one just to be an individual panel. So quite quickly I'm able to take something that was already there, copy bits of it, manipulate it and change it to something else. I can then actually change the function of that individual panel there, we could make it a double hung window if we want, uh, so we can have a sliding sash window, let's make it 50-50. So not really a traditional build, but we can play around with it and do what we have to do. Uh, in order to, to create the one that we actually need there. So that's just a quick taster on a, a sort of fairly standard one. Obviously that updates, yeah, it broadcasts a little bit behind, but obviously that updates, and we can pick up the properties and we can go and inject them elsewhere and, and do what we have to do. But I'm conscious of the time, so let's skip on to these truly horrendous windows on the, the other side of the building. These are, you could say, custom windows. And what I'll maybe do is begin by selecting this one. And if we take a look at the window settings, there we go. Again, I'm going to just play around with the overall shape. You get a nice optical illusion in here when you look at the the preview of it because of the, the actual geometry involved. But let's just go change the overall shape. So I quite like the angle top. Obviously, we can change to all these other shapes. Maybe what we'll do is change the base. And maybe what we'll do is go for cut corners. And pretty sure the dimension for these millions is 640 and if we also take these two sides maybe make them 400 you can see the preview updates and changes and does everything else that we want with it. In terms of the angle at the top here we can either set a height or we can set a depth depending on what information we know about but I know I'll get a 20 degree pitched roof so all we do is stick in 20 degrees and that then matches the angle of the roof that's in place there. If we take a look at dimensions, we can play around with other bits and pieces here. In fact, let's go to glazing first, because what it can do is, again, just play with the shape. So let's just insert a bottom row. And I should have gone to dimensions and paid more attention. Silly, silly, silly. So we'll make that 400. 
Sorry, wrong piece. We'll make that one 400. Because I've also inserted a second panel in here. Um, back to the glazing. And again, as you saw earlier, I can pick any of these bits up. But maybe what I'll do is I'll just take this bottom panel. And what we'll do with it is rather than a fixed pane, I'll actually come right down to the bottom here and just turn it into a sort of vanity vision panel type thing. Um, so we just close it off completely. You can't see through it. It's invisible. Again, I can go in here. We could spend loads of time, but you can set rows above, uh, either in the panel or across the entire top window, so you can turn this into any sort of shape you want. But as I carry on, if I just click out here and OK, what you'll see is that that updates the window and looks truly magnificent. I'm sure you'll agree. There's also options here. We can use intelligent hotspots which I try not to do too much of this in the broadcast because it, it doesn't update quite quickly enough, but hopefully you can see the dotted line. We can actually drag these components around visually in the 3D window to design the window exactly where we want it to appear. So I'll come out of that and try not to do too much of that. The other thing that Dozen Windows gives us is the ability to create schedules, and these are a bit like creating um, sort of detail sheets. So here we have elevations of each one of the, the components that's already been placed. I've set it in a, a sort of pre-configured way to give me A3 sheets. So you'll see if I rest the mouse just on that border, that's actually a, a sort of invisible frame that allows you to place it on an A3 sheet and know that it's going to fit in place and, and do what you want it to do. If I do a refresh on here though, we should see, because I'm sure I changed one of those windows, we should see an update and we should see one of these five windows change to show the extra side light panels that I put in place along with the, the sliding sash. There we go. So that's updated as well as the, I really don't know how to describe it, as well as that fantastic thing there. In addition, we can also do little things like drop into the settings tell it just to collate the matching items. We can change the layout. So I'm on A3s here. Maybe I want to work on A4s or A1s or whatever it is. We can change all of that to whatever we need to be. We can change what dimensions are physically displayed. Um, if we want the sill height, if we want to turn off the sash and shape, whatever it happens to be. And we can change all the properties of the labels and things. So if I just apply and close that down, then what you'll see is the layouts have updated and there's only doors visible, so I must have actually <laughs> pressed more than I thought. Yep, I want windows as well, thanks very much. So we just apply that, close that down, and now you can see the update. And what you'll actually see, if I go and zoom in on this first door, there's an actual little graphic that says, as shown, we have door ID, door first, zero one, uh, door first floor 05 and then as a handed version is number two so we can group the components together that way. So the next thing to look at is just a real brief one, this is just slab coverings and it's just to show how easy they are once they're, once they're in place. Basically you select a slab, initially you select a slab and from the menu coverings you'd say um, give me a slab covering and then you go and define and choose what it's actually going to be. If you then decide later to go and edit the shape, so here I have slab already in place, we'll add a new point there, we'll add another new point there, and then what we'll do is take this edge and just offset it slightly. You'll see the covering actually goes with it and updates. And the covering is actually uh, simple, but I suppose complicated at the same time, an object that tracks the shape. So here I can come in and I can actually reapply those edging boards just to finish the whole shape off. So we can do that sort of thing. So it's just an object that tracks the basic shape and gives us what we need to see. Exactly the same thing applies to the roof tool and the roof covering. So here we have a magnificent roof. Um, it looks okay, but it's not very exciting because you're looking at a 2D plan of a roof. But there's a couple of things with it. And the first one is you'll see there's a couple of downpipes already in place. You can also see there's edging boards, there's ridges, there's valleys. There's all sorts of things going on uh, round about the screen. First off, let me just select the covering. And as I said earlier, it's object based, same as a slab. Here we can change the position of the, uh, the wall underneath. But what I want to do is look at these little hotspots here. First one that's out on its own, that allows me to actually change the cut angle. So that if I was 
connecting two bits of roof that were actually separate Archicad bits of roof, we can mitre them together. But um, what I actually want to do is look at this little hotspot because if you ever tried to place downpipes manually in Archicad, it's a bit of a horrendous nightmare unless you know all the sizes and angles and type of connections and fittings you want. Here, because it's part of the roof, it knows the height, um, it knows the positions. Uh, in the settings, I've chosen it obviously as a round downpipe in this case. So all I do is just grab it, drag it where I want it to be, and it drops it down for me. So very, very simple. Uh, in addition to that, we can even do little things like change the offset, or I could pick up this piece here, and we can even change the angle if we have to work around some sort of feature on the building and we want to get right out to the very end of the, the corner of the gutter, we can do all that sort of stuff. So if we take a look at that in 3D, you can see how it looks. So I already mentioned we have tiles on here. Um, maybe I've got a bit carried away with the amount of black paint of yours because you can't really see much of the detail, but I suppose if we select, you can see there's there's little tiles over the edges, there's barge boards, there's um, soffits, there's ridge tiles, there's the guttering. There is the downpipe, which, let's be honest, is a little bit short of the mark of where it needs to be, but that's purely because the object's on the, the first floor, and all I have to do is just pick up the base of it and then tell it how deep it needs to extend. So we just take it down and line it up with that other component that's already in place. While I've got that selected, I'm going to get into the settings and just have a quick look at some of the different types and things we can do. So again, we have a, a physical graphical way of coming in here, picking an edge and overriding is it a barge, an apron, a barge gutter, do we want no edge on it? We can change all these settings and can select all the outside edges. If there was openings in there for Veloxes or, or anything else, then we can go and change all of those. But what I'll do is just quickly look at the cladding. We have a choice of different types. So we can have no cladding at all and just see the Archicad roof that's underneath but still put on the fascias, the valleys, ridges, gutters, whatever we want. We can have a flat finish, corrugated, ribbed. Shingles is the one I've used here because it gives nice sort of flat, uh, almost like slate. Tiles and then the Spanish tiles. But the one I'm going to go for is the ribbed one. And let's set it so it looks like a, a sort of standing seam. So we'll 450 centers. We'll make the ridges 25 mil wide, and just for the sake of changing that, we'll make them 22 mil high. We can change the offset, we can go into the settings here, and rather than have it grey, let's just make it stainless steel. And we'll get full control over the pens and the fills and the colours, and everything that's used to actually document it as well. Tons of other options here, I'm just going to quickly go through them. Uh, framing options. We can have different types of framing from timber, C section, or Z section, and define various bits with it. We can set what the edge board properties are. So let's just change that to two. We can change the soffits. So let's make the soffits um, sloped. Um, probably won't work here because I haven't actually paid much attention to what's going on, but we'll try. The flashing, we could change and make, let's make it a square rib, just again because I want to. The gutters some downpipes. Well, they're already round, so let's go and make them rectangular. Round pipe, and let's make the gutter a concealed gutter. But I'd like to be able to see it, so let's go start using some uh, truly horrendous colours. So, I'll have some blue. I'll go to the flashings, and let's just take all the flashings and make them all paint 20. Whatever else I want to do, I can play around with it. And then there's also display options for what's visible, where and when, and how it behaves. But if I just hit OK, what that does is go and update. You can now see my blue downpipes, my green flashings. I've got my standing seam roof. Hopefully you can see there's a little bit of yellow flash in there. That is the, the guttering that I changed the concealed gutter to a, a yellow internal finish. The final one to look at here is just the, the wall coverings. So here we have quite a nice sort of detailed wall. This is a standard wall that has a covering applied to the face of it. So we can see there is boarding above sill level in the window, there's also block work that goes from sill level down. The ground is actually, or sorry, the wall is actually um, 450 or so uh, below ground down to foundation level, which is why you're seeing it disappear there. But if we again take a quick look at the settings, these are the different types of coverings available. If we take a look at the cladding types, in fact, let's just change the covering layout. I'll go for this one here. 
So what this allows me to do if I set that to 200 is have one type of finish below the windows, one type of finish at window level, one type above and we can also go and change uh, above the openings. So above the openings let's change that to be logs. There's not enough logs in this world. Uh, no offset. We'll make them maybe 140. Uh, they should stand out quite nicely. Uh, we'll change the materials so they are oak. So that should stand out nicely. Above the head height uh, on the windows, maybe we'll change this to be panels so we can make this a sort of tile effect. And we'll make them maybe 450 by 450. And let's just make them proper tile, and we'll paint them tile mosaic blue. So completely changing the surfaces, but you can see there's various zones that you're actually able to distinguish in the, the various different components within a wall covering. So if I OK that, off it goes and updates, and you should see something truly spectacular. So we've got various different bits and pieces. And again, we can pick up properties and go inject them. So you can see our tiles extending around and carrying on to the, the next piece of wall in the chain there. So that's a brief look at coverings, but obviously that's the visual side of it. This is also creating documentation in the sense that if we look at this section, we can see there's the partial elevation of this wonderful wall, but up here we've got a slight issue with the detail that I've used for that part, so we'll probably skip over that. But you can see the, the downpipe, the guttering, we can see the, I mentioned the slates, the timber studs, which are probably a bit on the, the large side. Uh, way up at the top here, with slightly different detail now, because I have a ridge tile on one side, but then I have a um, some sort of flashing on top of the standing seam roof that I've put on to the other side. But when we come down here, we can then see our concealed gutter, and obviously the section doesn't extend far enough to show the guttering that's in there as well. It's more than just a, a 3D visual tool, it's also creating this important 2D documentation as well. So let's skip on. If we have a look at stairs, this, when it shows on your screen, is just an example of the five different types of structure we can use. Obviously you can change all the settings and materials and the attributes, but if we go back, what I wanted to show was just how this is different to regular Archicad. First thing is, I'm going to take this first stair run and I'm just going to change its length. So just visually, with a pet palette, we just change it to a different size. If I take the next one, I might take it from a straight run and turn it into a curve. I've changed these two, just changing the basic shape, but what I can also do is go into the stair tool and actually switch into what's called stair shape edit mode. And that means I can do things like with these new hotspots that appear in each corner, is pick up the top edge and maybe just kick the whole top edge slightly outwards. You can do the same on the bottom of this one. Or maybe what we'll do with the last one is pick it up and use these middle intelligent hotspots and do something like that and that. There we go. So if I now look at the same 3D view, what you'll see is that the stair types have completely changed, but the basic parameters remain the same. So obviously this is a different method of editing the, the shapes than standard Archicad, because standard Archicad, this would all have to be driven through the stair maker dialog. But if I look at how we actually place them, that's also fundamentally different. In a similar sort of way, we don't want to design the stair by physically putting a load of numbers into dialog box because we're not really sure what the, the situation is going to be until we can see the stair in the space that it's, it's supposed to be. So if we get to the design tool, grab this poly stair tool, I've put some hotspots down here just to give me some guides. So all I'm going to do is say, let's start a run from there to there. And I'm then going to switch to a landing, which is going to go to this point here, out to this corner. Then I'll go back to a straight run, which rises to there, and then we'll finish on a curved run. So we'll take that round and finish on this corner. A couple of differences there. One, I was able to just physically create the thing on the fly just by sketching out the shape. 
But secondly, that sort of shape would not be possible as one stair in standard Archicad because it's not got the ability to go from uh, an L shape with a, a full landing to a uh, curve shape. So we have that. What I can then do is just stick a marquee through that area. And let's make it a thick marquee. Have a look at 3D because it'd be useful to check that everything works. We fit that in the window, looks perfect, ideal. Well, maybe I should turn the building around. And there is a slight issue here because I've got the, the base of the stair on the wrong floor. So let's just check that. Let's just ruin the next job, unfortunately. So on the ground floor, it should be at zero because usually that's where we start to climb stairs. And what I was going to show with it was obviously the overall size, the overall rise is wrong. And we grab that hot spot there and we say let's change the height and line it up with this component here. So basically we're lining up with the upper floor. And what it then does is recalculate the stair and allows it to dynamically fit that into that physical space. So that is a basic shape. There's a couple of health and safety issues I'm sure you'll all agree get on here because there's no railing along this face, there's no railing on the stairs themselves. So quickly back to 2D and what I'm going to do is grab the railing tool. Now this works in two ways. If you have a Mercedes icon and you click, what it'll do is place a railing on that particular segment, that length of stair. But if I undo that, the second way it works is if I tick mark and click, then what it will do is trace that entire length. And what I can do is go up a floor nice and quickly because in addition to railings working on stairs, I can also put them onto, uh, in this case, the edge of a slab on the upper floor to close off that landing. If I go back down quickly, just a final bit to show, I'm going to grab all the poly stairs segments and what I'm going to do this time is assemble the stair because right now it's a component for them. So I could go and change the structure from the straight run or the curved run or the landing or whatever it happens to be. But at some stage when I'm happy with the design, I'm going to turn it into one physical object. So it makes it a lot easier for scheduling, for moving or mirroring or any of these sort of bits and pieces. Um, at any time, you can go back into edit modes and it will break it back down to, into its component form. But just in terms of display, it's a lot easier to manipulate this way. Because I'm in a, a rotated view, this default angle that's come in here is a little bit funny looking, but let's just grab the stair and the cut line that I can see here, we just go and reposition it to somewhere more appropriate. Pick that point and we just move along the stair to somewhere else. And one of the other nice things about this, the way this is actually programmed, if I go up to the floor above, you'll see there's a completely independent cut line. So what I can do is take that cut line and just move that to a different position. So you have full control over the display on the upper floor, the lower floor, wherever you need it to be. So that's a real quick look at stairs. If I quickly go to objective, now one of the main things objective does is allows the ability to edit objects within a library and manipulate them in ways that's just not possible with the standard software. So here we have a caravan that's been inconsiderately parked halfway through the building. Um, obviously that's a bit of an issue but we can make use of this as a design feature within the building. And the first thing I'm going to do is go to the objective menu and say just split this and let's just cut it in half. So I'm going to get rid of the bottom half of it. So it's like taking a big old chainsaw, select that lot and delete it. So I'm now left with half a caravan. And then what I can do is take this half because that tow bar is just going to become a trip hazard. And again, we'll take this and we will split. And if I just randomly draw a line across there somewhere, obviously you can do it a lot more precisely, but for speed and time, I'm just quickly doing this sort of stuff. As it is, you know, it's not all that exciting because inside the room all you're going to see is the, the end of a caravan. So what we'll probably do is select it here and Another option is to go in and rotate it. So we'll take it from there, on that axis, but rotate it up 90 degrees. And what we're doing now is looking at the top of it, and obviously we're going to use it as some sort of dining table. The chairs are already in place there to go and line up and, and use as we need. So I'll just move that down slightly. And just to finish off, there's a whole load of other things that Objective does, but I'm just quickly running through the process. What I'm going to do is just bend that 
um, steel beam that runs through there just because I can. It's another feature that uh, we have the ability to do there. I can also go and line up the tables and chairs and various other bits and bobs. But uh, conscious of the time, so let's just quickly move on to electrical. It also ties in position number five. Electrical is already in place here. I've got some components in. Um, and all I was going to do is just show quickly you know, how they look. They look like 2D components. You can do this, exactly the same thing with 2D splines, but the big difference here is these are electrical uh, wiring components that are connected to the sockets, the switches, components, and the lights. You can wire to any electrical device, so if you want to put a socket in that turns your power on and off for a washing machine, a cooker, a fridge freezer, that can all be done. But what I'm going to do here is just take this lamp and just physically move it. And you'll see as it moves, the wiring automatically moves with it. And if I was to do something like actually change its position entirely, you'll see the wiring reroutes to the next shortest, most sensible location. If I physically remove that lamp, then the wiring uh, through the next lamp to the switch, that is automatically rerouted and connected up. So it's, it's quite intelligent the way it actually works. You can also take these shapes. You'll see there's some hot spots. And we can go and reposition them if there's particular components on the screen that we want to work around. In terms of how it actually works, though, what we do is use the electrical tool, and it sits in the toolbox down here. So all I'm going to do is just make sure there's nothing selected. Go into the electrical tool. And the first thing I'm going to do is just place some 2D switches. So let's have, you can see there's a range of the different ones here. Let's just go for a standard switch. And I want to put a switch just up here. Well, let's put it on this wall here. So just click the mouse. And you'll see I haven't actually spent any time configuring orientation of the angle. Uh, it's pre-configured with the size and colors and uh, the text that's displayed. That's the height of the component. Um, but what you'll see is if I click near a wall, it automatically locates itself right next to the wall. There is, a, again, settings that determine what that distance is. But it's more impressive if I switch the orientation so that I'm then working in true orientation. And again, I just click near a wall, then it automatically locates itself and snaps into place. So let's not get too carried away. I have one switch there, one switch there. And then basically the workflow is, if I select the bits that I want to connect together, so as I say, this could be any electrical component. What I can do is go into the electrical menu and just tell it to add the circuit wiring. And that automatically goes and connects up these components. So straight away, if I was to select a lamp and just move it somewhere else, then you'll see it automatically redoes the routing as well. So undo that. The final part to electrical is once I've actually got these switches in place, these are just 2D symbols right now. But what I can do is grab them, again, go to the menu, and the final part is add a wall plate. And what it does is detect it. I've got two switches selected. What I want to do is one at a time have just a standard UK switch. There's a range here. There's obviously UK, US. You can filter these. Maybe this time on this side I'll put on a dimmer switch just because I want to. And what that does is if I take a marquee, go to 3D. What you see is I made a slight mistake because this wall is just a little partition and the switch is too high, but it's very useful for contrasting to show that there's an actual dimmer switch in place here. And you'll see there's various components for the, the screw holes and things that you can actually get a proper elevation from these components. In addition to that, the final part is we can actually put together schedules. These come out of the box uh, with electrical, or out the download, I should say. And if I actually go to my layouts, then once these update, what you'll actually see is the schedule's all in place without actually having to do any work at all. It's just automatically created for us. You can see the information that's put in place um, nice and simply for us. If I now go back, final couple of bits to have a quick look at. Detail elements is a, a sort of side issue. I've just used them on this section before I come to keynotes. So um, you'll see here we have a, a section through the building. It's got quite a bit of 2D detail in terms of the insulation of the roof, the bricks and the walls, and now the lovely logs on the, the outer skin of the wall as well. Um, but if we go look at the sort of footing foundation, I've actually used a slab edge to create the, the footing detail. But this 2D rebar uh, symbol, this is from the, the 2D um, detailing library. Same with the wall components here. If we come across and look at this partition, then the little timber stud wall, again, the timber studs, 
this is all created from the detailing library right down to the nuts and bolts. And the detailing library is just a completely separate 2D tool and it consists of this range of objects in here. So I'm just real quickly going through it because we're running short of time. Final bit to look at though is keynotes and that also happens to be this section. And keynotes are these little things, the little leaders that give us little references on the drawing. I've chosen to show the keynotes as just pure the keynote reference. There's a whole load of different ways we can actually display them. If I go to the label tool and select all the labels here, keynotes is a an add-on that basically adds this panel to the label tool along with a database behind it and a whole load of other stuff. But briefly it adds this panel and what we can do is say let's maybe change and have the short description rather than the key visible. And what it will do is it changes and actually updates so we have internal walls, skirting, new power connection. You know, this is taken from the Keynote database. So let's just put that back to the way it was previously. And what we'll do to actually use this, I need to find Keynotes, and I could do with the Keynotes palette. And this is what drives this whole Keynotes tool. So we have a number of sections where the Keynotes are broken into different types of component. So I'm specifically going for number eight here. I'm not going to pick them at random. I've no idea what I'm actually choosing. But I just want to show a particular thing when we come to look at the layouts and how they're pieced together. So in this drawing right now, there are no Keynote references that are from the external number eight folder. So all we do is we choose a keynote. We can actually choose to place independent single keynotes, so these ones here are just independent singles. We can have independent multiples, so this one here where this wall component I'm labeling consists of three separate notes that are then grouped together. And we can also have element keynotes, so we could take the slab and we could have keynotes associated with each skin of the composite, so it puts together a keynote and gives us an overall description of what that component is. In this case, let's just go for retaining wall and we will just place one down here somewhere. So that puts down 8104. So let's just take a different one and I'm just going to point at the roof and just place these down. Oh, no, no. I'll get one, one. Uh, a different one across there, so put in some separate components. Behind this, if I go to the Keynotes Manager, there is this entire database that we can actually go into, and if we just edit that one, so again, I sort of randomly picked one up. We have, first of all, the reference number, so that uniquely identifies it within the Keynotes database. We have what's called the short description. We also have here, it's not been used, but there is a sort of spec reference, so if you want to use an MBS reference clause, something like that, you can place that in here and that can also be linked and displayed on the plans, sections, elevations, 3D documents, whatever. We have the main description and then we have the folder it's actually placed in. So maybe if I cancel that and go for, um, say, site, let's check that one. There we go. So you can see the short description is just very descriptive, 200mm panel. And then it tells us in here it's precast, concrete panel, blah, 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 blah. The full description that we need to actually put together the spec. So if we come back out of all of this, where this really comes into its own is when we then go to the layouts. So if we take a look at this keynote, and what you'll see is right now the actual view has been updated. So this view will now include the reference, which is off the bottom of the screen ideally, but it has reference 811 and there's 812 just off to the side here. But what you'll see is on the side of the layout sheet, there's a full set of notes. And this is an object that what it does, pretty intelligently, is examine the views that are placed on this particular page and goes and pulls out any of the keynote references that come from these drawings. So you'll see right now it finishes on number seven. But obviously I've added uh, a number eight. So let's zoom in a little bit. There we go. And what I'll do is just go into Keynotes. And all I'm going to do is tell it to go and update the schedule for this particular layout. So all I'll do is hit OK. It reads what's in there and automatically it's gone and placed number eight. And it's been configured. You can configure it a whole host of different ways to display it whatever way you want it to be. So there's a bit of a delay. I'm actually watching the broadcast, so there's a bit of a delay between what it's zoom and what actually happens. So I'll try and calm that down a bit. But what you'll see is it goes and it finds clause number 81114, 
uh, into one and it brings in the text. But within this, as I say, it's an object, so you can go and configure it in whatever way you want to show whatever information you want in there. That kind of concludes the, the final part of the presentation in Archicad. In terms of how the tools are actually developed, they work in conjunction with the release cycle of Archicad. There is a good close relationship with Hungary. In terms of how that actually works, it works pretty well because going back all the way to Archicad 10, all the CAD image tools have been delivered for the latest version on time for the release date. And I know specifically 17 because I was involved with it. It was actually available for about a week or so in the UK before the actual Archicad software was. So it's, it's timed very carefully to make sure it's delivered on time because we don't want people having to wait. We obviously can't guarantee things will be ready, but the aim is 110% to make sure it's delivered on time as much as possible. The focus with all these updates and things is always to, to fix any bugs that come up, obviously, but then to enhance it with uh, feedback from users, from just the way that the whole marketplace changes to give it the most um, usability in the, the current marketplace. In terms of pricing, I've not really mentioned it, but it's available on the website for all the tools. Depending on where you are, I know we've got people from all over the world here, but there's five major currencies that we can deal in. In terms of multiple licenses, we have a pretty good structure that the more licenses you buy, the cheaper it becomes. So once you're over 10 licenses, if you're in a large company and need 10 licenses of keynotes or 15 licenses, then you're looking at a 60% discount, which is, is pretty significant. There's also bundle discounts because you may just be a, a one-man band practice and you might need two or three different tools. Again, depending on how many you buy, up to five products, you get up to a 20% discount on that. So it's to try and make it as affordable as possible. Upgrades, those are fixed at 20% of the, the selling price of the original product. So they're nice and easy to budget and work out. In terms of resources, you know, after today, if you want to go and look at these other bits and pieces, all the software is available on a free 30-day trial basis. So all you have to do is go into caramies.com, register your details, which is very simple, you don't have to give too many details, and then you're available to, to download and run the software for 30 days free of charge. It's also available for each students and educational versions. As part of your trial period, you access the online support centre, the ticket system, the knowledge base. There's tutorials and tips online as well. There's also the help centre where you can actually log tickets if you do have any particular issues with it. And obviously for those of you in the UK or this part of the world, you've also got access to uh, me, sadly, if you have any particular problems. Just a, a little bit, there's, there's a month to go on this particular product. You may or may not be aware of it already, but we have a new tool that's in development called Point Cloud. It's beta software for 16 and 17, and um, basically what it allows you to do is read Point Cloud data from a surveyor and bring it into Archicad. So some examples there. At this stage, it's in development. We haven't worked out just exactly what the workflow is going to be because we need people to use the point cloud data, see what they want to do with it, see how they manipulate it, and then we can develop it further. So it's, it's in a beta stage that we're looking for feedback from users. The current beta build expires at the end of the month, so you've still got a month or so to, to run that, have a play with it and see what you think of it, and let us know how you think it should be developed. I'd like to say thanks for taking the time to attend.